I talk to people in the energy industry and they seem uh, to go beyond the notion of an afterthought. They seem to have tacitly uh, uh, internalized uh, the assumption that for some reason WTO rules don't apply to them. I've thought about this, and uh, I think it's because of a point I made a moment ago, which is that over the course of the past uh, half century, uh, our disputes have been about import restrictions, and a few people have wanted to restrict imports uh, of oil or natural gas. Uh, uh, they want them when they want them, and they don't want to restrict them. Uh, and it's only now that we're focusing on export restrictions that it's dawning on anyone that these rules might apply uh, to oil or natural gas or coal or other energy products. Indeed, they do. Indeed, they do. Uh, these uh, products are traded products to which WTO rules apply. Uh, here, uh, I will be suggestive as opposed to definitive, uh, but uh, one of the agreements in the WTO treaty that is uh, at issue here is the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, Article 11 of the GATT. I had the misfortune uh, while I was in the Congress of actually having read the GATT. Uh, the Article 11 of the GATT imposes uh, uh, a prohibition on quantitative restrictions of exports. Uh, there is an exception in the language uh, due to a compromise at the Havana Conference in 1947 that says you can have export taxes. But we don't do export taxes in the United States, so that's not an issue for us. Uh, we are bound by this uh, general prohibition on quantitative restrictions on exports. Uh, there are uh, some uh, exceptions, uh, but um, those exceptions don't necessarily excuse uh, what's going on. For example, you can have temporary uh, restrictions where there are critical shortages. There are no critical shortages here. Uh, in terms of oil and natural gas, and the uh, restrictions we have on crude oil exports in our law are not temporary. Uh, by terms of the law, they are uh, permanent. So that exception uh, <clears throat> doesn't apply. Uh, there are also some defenses that are potentially available under Article 20 of the GATT. Uh, relating to uh, measures that are uh, imposed uh, because they're necessary to health or because they relate to the conservation of uh, exhaustible natural resources. Potentially, these kinds of defenses could be available, but only if these measures are of a certain kind and if they are applied in a certain way. Uh, just to mention uh, a couple of examples, uh, if you're going to uh, uh, have a, a benefit of an environmental defense, you have to have an environmental measure. And all of the discussion that we've heard uh, about uh, whether we should or should not lift restrictions on exports uh, in, of these energy products has been about the effect uh, on the competitiveness of U.S. industry. It hasn't been about the environment. Uh, and then, even if these measures are of a certain uh, nature, they have to be applied in a way that does not uh, result in arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries uh, where the same conditions prevail or an undisguised uh, or a disguised restriction on international trade. Here I'm quoting the chapeau, as they say in Geneva, of Article 20. And uh, query, as uh, we would say in the law classes, whether we would pass that particular test for that defense. There are also certain other questions that arise uh, in my mind, given the prism through which I see these particular measures, that uh, are rarely discussed, if at all, in the public debate. We've heard today about the exceptions in the uh, natural gas uh, uh, licensing uh, rules for uh, countries with whom we have free trade agreements. Well, um, are these particular exceptions legal under the WTO? I don't know. I haven't delved into the depths of these, but uh, any uh, free trade agreement uh, with uh, one uh, member of the WTO is, uh, by definition, uh, uh, a decision to discriminate and trade against another uh, or many more uh, members of the WTO. How is that legal 
given the WTO's general rule of non-discrimination. It's legal only if you have a free trade agreement. What is a free trade agreement? Under Article 24, a free trade agreement applies uh, to substantially all the trade among the parties to that agreement. What is substantially all of the trade? One of my great accomplishments in nearly a decade as a jurist in Geneva is that I was able to get out of Geneva alive without having to answer that question. But some country that's not a privy or a party to one of these special arrangements may raise their hand in the WTO and ask that question. And under WTO rules, it will then have to be answered. <clears throat> one other issue I'll uh, mention is uh, the issue of subsidies on which Scott touched. Uh, this is a fascinating to topic. Uh, in addition to the GATT, another of the WTO agreements uh, uh, that is part of the WTO treaty is the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. It's there more than any other reason because the United States worked decades to make certain it was there to define a subsidy and make certain that subsidies were disciplined so as not to distort free trade in products worldwide. And uh, we have been diligent in trying to insist on the uh, uh, fair and thorough uh, implementation uh, of the subsidies agreement. The question is that by restricting exports so as to reduce domestic prices of uh, oil or natural gas, is the United States granting a subsidy to the manufacturing firms that are the downstream domestic users of natural gas. As has already been mentioned, it has been the U.S. position in a number of cases that uh, uh, this type of arrangement is a subsidy. Uh, and it is one that uh, needs, needs either to be withdrawn uh, or uh, it is one that uh, can be countered through countervailing duties. Uh, it is possible that someone could bring a case against the United States making these same arguments <clears throat> that we have made against others and prevail against us and uh, have the effect of raising the prices of our exports. I would make only one general observation before stepping down. I I'll try to answer your questions uh, to the extent that you have them in whatever time we have left. But um, the general observation I would like to make would be about uh, what I see as the illusion of self-sufficiency. Uh, this is not a new notion. Scott mentioned the notion of autarky. We have that work because the Greeks invented it, and they invented it because of the notion of self-sufficiency that they had. But I would hope we had grown beyond that. Uh, we, if not, we need to go back and read Adam Smith and David Ricardo and a few others. Um, the notion that we can be self-sufficient uh, is an illusion. No one country is ever going to be self-sufficient in everything. There's always going to be something that we will want from someone else. Furthermore, um, any one of us uh, as an individual should be comparable to a country in that do we really want to be self-sufficient in all that we do? Do I want to uh, make my own watch? Do I want to uh, draw my own water? Do I want to make my own pen? Uh, division of labor is at the heart of our complex society and our complex world. International trade is international only because it crosses lines that are artificial. Uh, they, those lines exist only because we believe that they do. Uh, an economist would tell us, indeed Adam Smith told us, that the division of labor is limited only by the extent of the marketplace. Increasingly, the marketplace is worldwide. And what we should be seeking, in my view, is economic uh, and energy uh, security and not independence. Because uh, the notion of independence in energy especially is an illusion and imposing restrictions on exports as a matter of policy is, in my view, short-sighted and self-defeating economic nationalism. It is also, in many respects, illegal under international law.